From boomers to zoomers, when I'm 65 is a multi-generational approach to financial and financial investment and education. Investment. Helping folks of all ages build a secure path toward retirement, whether it's down the road or just around the corner. And you are watching PBS Books. Hi, I'm Fred Nahat. Nice to have you along with us for the first episode of When I'm 65, From Boomers to Zoomers, an all-new virtual series about financial and investor education produced in partnership with our friends at the Investor Protection Trust, uh, working together to ensure that all Americans have more knowledge about uh, their own money. Today's episode, we are going to look into the COVID effect, a conversation about financial and economic recovery post-COVID. Now, as we emerge from our quarantine, we'll look at the lessons learned uh, over the past year on how to better set ourselves up for retirement. Lots more coming up, but first, let's hear from PBS Books Library Bureau Chief, Heather Montia, with a word on how America's public libraries are playing a key role in our series of virtual events. Today, when I'm 65, Boomers to Zoomers event is going out to the PBS Books channel, streaming to our network of partners, including more than 1,800 libraries across all 50 states, helping to connect our national audience to important topics like this event. Especially in the last year, your local library has been working tirelessly to share quality content with its communities. And so they join us again today, live streaming this event, this gathering on their own social media channels, extending the message of today's important event. And as always, building on the important work they do for learners of all ages. PBS Books joins in this effort and we are so pleased to help amplify today's work. We encourage you to share on your social media and also to visit our website at pbsbooks.org. Thank you. All right, Heather, thank you. Today's program is being generously funded by a grant from the Investor Protection Trust. The IPT is a nonprofit organization devoted to investor education. Since 1993, the IPT has worked with the states to provide independent, objective investor education uh, so that all Americans can be informed and make wise decisions and wise investments at any stage of their life. The state regulatory offices are also playing a key role in this education series. You may or may not be familiar with the agency in your state, but each one serves its citizens and works hard to protect them from fraud by regulating investment firms and the investment products offered in each state. Securities regulators are devoted to unbiased financial and investor education and offer a wealth of resources for free to all citizens. Securities regulators can't give investment advice, but they do provide the materials you need to make the best and most sound choice for your future. Many securities regulators offices partner with the IPT and are joining us today to bring you this event. Uh, the goal is that you are able to take something away from this discussion as you plan for your retirement and also to inform you about the additional resources all available at your disposal online. To learn more about your individual state regulatory office, visit nasa.org slash contact your regulator. Now let us welcome in our moderator for today's event. Donna Lowry is a veteran broadcaster, legislative reporter and host and producer of the lawmakers seen on Georgia Public Broadcasting. Donna, it's great to see you. You've been digging into this lots ahead on When I'm 65. Oh, absolutely. In the past year, I've had a chance to talk to the experts and how to navigate and translate complex financial topics. So I'm excited to be a part of this event today to learn more and learn with everybody else who's a part of this. We'll be addressing three main topics and then have some Q&A time. Now, if you have a question, drop it in the comment section of PBS Books, the Facebook live stream that you may be watching right now, or send us an email to the address on your screen. The topics we'll discuss today include the stimulus money and how the payments can bridge the gaps in current investments or create a stronger security net. We'll also address the new career landscape and what it means for retirement planning. 
and we'll talk about how to create a secure financial cushion to protect your savings from emergencies in the future. But let's get started with how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected our psychological health. I want to welcome Seth Norham, an associate professor of psychiatry at Wayne State University. Welcome, welcome Thank Seth, you. thanks for joining us. Thank you, it's good to be here. Well, let's get right into it. What are some of the common signs of an anxious relationship with money and how can we overcome that feeling? Well, you know, you ask a psychologist, um, you know, a question about people's behavior, the, the answer invariably is gonna be some version of it depends. And in the wake of this pandemic, um, where people stood uh, really depended on where they were uh, at the beginning of it. And so we've talked about this in terms of it being a tsunami. So the pandemic itself being a tsunami that sort of swept up everybody, and then the after effects psychologically, financially, also being a tsunami of sorts that, you know, we're all still trying to find our, our, our balance or, or solid ground. And so what we found was, is that people, when you ask them about their, their psychological state during the pandemic and in its uh, aftermath, is some people were really well prepared. Some people had dual uh, incomes and they were able to work from home. So there wasn't much of a loss of income. For other people, there was maybe a single income uh, for the home or a loss of a job. And so people in these situations, uh, it was obviously a much different situation. And so you think about where people were getting their revenue and their money and where it was going. And, and some industries actually did well as a result of the pandemic. So if you look at e-commerce, amazon.com, if you look at food delivery services, if you look at uh, grocery deliveries, those are all businesses that actually boomed during the pandemic. And so people that were in that uh, situation actually did quite well. Then there were others who actually worked in say, face-to-face -face industries, whether it was restaurants, hotels, uh, travel. For example, in 2019, uh, TSA saw 2.5 million people a day come through screenings. And at the peak last year, the pandemic, it was down to 100,000. So the travel industry really suffered. So psychologically speaking, people come out of the pandemic and they ask themselves, what am I gonna do moving forward? For a lot of people, not much is gonna change. There may, may be some initial change in spending, there may be an uptick in what they put in savings, uh, but for the most part, not much is gonna change. Uh, but for other people, maybe the pandemic gave them a different perspective. They spent so much time in their home that they realized they didn't like the house that they lived in or they didn't like the person they lived with. And they make major life decisions coming out of this pandemic. So it's really going to depend on, on where people started and where they want to go. So it's really given a, a lot of perspective to people in terms of how they spend their time and how they spend their money. Yeah, quite a tsunami that we're actually in, amounted to people kind of resetting their lives. But let's talk about investments. What implications could we see as a result of the pandemic at this point? I think people's investment strategies are going to be pretty much mirrored to their, their general demeanor and their general approach towards life. So people that were more uh, uh, conservative and, and saved and prepared more before the pandemic are going to continue to do so. Like I said, you may have some people that their initial reaction is I better put more into savings or I better put more towards uh, college education, but ultimately the spending patterns are going to come back. The other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of people didn't spend as much last year. And so there's more money to invest. They didn't pay for childcare. They didn't pay for summer camp. They didn't pay for clothes for work because they were working from home. All of that is money that can be turned around into an investment. Yeah, I, I can see that all happening and then people are trying to regroup and try to figure out how that happens now. I want to thank you so much, Professor Norholm, for talking with us. Interesting stuff. Thank you. Good to be yeah. here. Well, as you know, earlier this month, the U.S. Congress, Congress passed um, a third, a third COVID-19 relief package. It gives another check to individuals and families whose incomes have fall beyond, they fall be under a certain threshold of sorts. So the two previous stimulus packages dished out similar checks, as well as an extended unemployment benefits and forgivable loans to small businesses. So let's dig right into talking about the relief aid and its impact. And joining us to do that is Nathan Reagan with the Economic Development Agency, Invest Atlanta. And 
also posh. She is the owner of a hair salon in Georgia. I want to welcome to both of you to our, our program here. Good afternoon from beautiful Atlanta. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Hi, Posh. Hi. Uh, look, look, let's start with you, Nathan. Let's get started. How has Invest Atlanta stepped up to help businesses in the past year? Well, thank you so much for that question and thank you for having us. Um, when the COVID uh, hit Atlanta, we knew immediately that our small businesses would be suffering. Um, and we really want to thank uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and our city council for them stepping up to the plate very quickly. Um, I will never forget this day, it was March 13th. Um, we knew that this was gonna be uh, really deep and our city council and our mayor's office stepped up with an immediate relief package, which we uh, rolled out within the first weeks of the COVID uh, pandemic. We were able to help uh, over 60 businesses with that, uh, that first relief package that we have. When CARES was finally approved and the city of Atlanta received $88 million of those CARES Act dollars, Invest Atlanta, which is the city of Atlanta's economic development agency, received roughly $20 million. Out of that $20 million, we were able to craft four different COVID relief programs addressing individual sectors of the Atlanta economy. All in all, we were able to help over 600 job, uh, 600 businesses, excuse me, in the city of Atlanta, and if that affected or retained or kept around 10,000 jobs, 9,778 jobs. Uh, we knew that our small businesses were going to be very, very hard hit, and we knew that equity was a real uh, focus for the city of Atlanta. And so most of our programs uh, went to help female and minority owned businesses. In some cases, 90% um, of our applicants and recipients of our loan dollars and grant dollars uh, were female and minority owned businesses. And, and I like to tell people that uh, the Invest Atlanta team and the city of Atlanta, we, from an economic perspective, were really frontline workers. Um, you know, we were dealing with uh, businesses every day that saw, saw a huge decline in their sales, that had invested their entire life savings in their business and needed some sort of relief. Um, so we were also a bit on the front lines to be able to help uh, Atlanta small businesses without this uh, relief funding. Um, you know, the Atlanta economy would have fared much, much worse. We're so glad to have Posh on with us today because Posh was one of the recipients of one of our programs. Um, and I think, you know, it's great when we're able to tell the story, but when someone like Posh is a recipient and can speak directly to it, um, I think it really uh, means a lot. So thank you so much. Oh, it sounds like you've done wonderful work. 600 businesses in that early, those early days is helped by what you're doing. So Posh, let's go right to you. Um, what did receiving the funding mean to you? Uh, it meant a lot. There were a lot of things going on, um, a lot of uncertainty on how things would look moving forward. Definitely a huge loss of income uh, by the mandated shutdown. So having something in place that I knew would be there for me to carry on with the things that was necessary to keep business open was a huge relief. Yeah, I'm sure those early days were a little scary for you. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so Nathan, how do relief programs like the stimulus dollars from the federal government aid in the nation's overall economic recovery? Well, look, uh, without these these funds, I mean, you've heard it directly from Posh. Without these funds, um, our small businesses, which are really what give a city like Atlanta its character and, it, and are the backbone of our economy, um, we would have lost uh, so much more. I um, mean, you know, I'm so glad to hear Posh um, really touch on some items that we were really focused on. We wanted to make sure that our small businesses had relief dollars to help with covering their rent payments in their commercial space or making sure that they retained employees. You know, we, we all know that employee loss was a huge, huge challenge for us. And so we focused on things like rent, uh, retaining jobs, and really, in some cases, really allowing businesses to really pivot. Um, Seth mentioned something very earlier that I think is really saving into the conversation is really how all of our businesses are able to pivot during this time. You know, if you're a legacy business in the city of Atlanta, you know how, and you know, you don't have an e-commerce platform, like now is the time. If you need to make deliveries of your product, um, you need to reach additional clients, 
you know, that's a great way to do that. We did a Facebook live series on how small businesses could pivot during COVID. Um, so all in all, the dollars and the education really helped businesses survive. And I'll just add here that what we realized, and I think maybe Posh was part of this program as well, is that the grant dollars are fantastic, but providing technical assistance to our businesses so that they can get through the crisis and not only get through it, but thrive um, is really uh, a lesson well learned for us. And the city of Atlanta, we're going to take that lesson and really uh, amplify that technical assistance piece um, as we move forward in our economic developments uh, for the city. Yeah. Sounds like you had to help businesses come up with new business practices in a sense um, under the pandemic. Um, Posh, what advice do you have for business owners who might be in those early stages right now of seeking some type of assistance? Uh, the biggest thing is to definitely look for the grants. There are a lot of programs out there. And what I like is a lot of the programs break down by industry. So you have a better chance of becoming a recipient. Uh, there are a lot of loans out there for business, but the grants are much better because they usually have other opportunities, just like with this one, where I was able to get technical help as well as money. Yeah, it's amazing the, the um, statistics that are coming in. So there's a Bloomberg survey of adults last month, and it says about a third of the respondents plan to save their third stimulus check. So Nathan, what guidance does your agency offer to help individuals or business owners make the best use of those payments? Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, I think that question is really so important right now. And it's not just us as the city's economic development agency, but it's also our technical assistance providers that really are contributing to a holistic view of how businesses can move through this and really use funds in the smartest way possible. Um, I am, I'm telling my staff and I'm telling uh, our businesses is getting through the COVID crisis is primarily the goal number one. And then how do you grow and expand, retain, grow and expand um, as we move out of the crisis? So um, I understand the, the need or people wanting to actually, you know, save that money. Uh, but there will be a point at some uh, at some point in the near future where businesses can reopen safely um, and then they can make those capital investments to grow their business so that the economy can come back to, to full force. Yeah, and you can feel people who want to just hold on to things because we don't know what's going to happen again. I want to thank you both for, for talking with us. Great information. My big takeaway is be willing to pivot. So thank you so much to both of you for helping us understand that a little bit more. Thank you. Well, well, next up, let's talk recovery. Unemployment peaked at an unprecedented level in April of 2020. Um, but now that multiple um, vaccines are on the market, more people are returning to the workplace. And so joining us to talk about that are Matt Rowling from the Office of Business Innovation at Wayne State University and Whitney Hansen. She's a financial and business coach from Idaho. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for having me, Donna. You're Thank glad you so you're much. on the screen there. Okay, so Whitney, let's start with you. The career landscape has changed for a lot of people. So what does that shift, this, this shift to so-called day jobs mean for investment and retirement planning? What a great question. I think what I have found for so many people is this is just re-illustrating the point that we need a long-term plan. That long-term plan is so important for our financial future. And what I like to remind people of is it's really important, no matter what shifts come your way, to be very firm on the goal, but flexible on the approach. And so what that could look like is maybe you're in a new position with entirely new options for retirement planning tools. So maybe you have a 401k that has a better match or possibly a worse match, actually. So it can go both ways. But ultimately, you have to look at the entire package to see what does this mean for my own life? Another key point that I really want everybody to take note on is not to lose track of your retirement accounts. It's so easy to get into a new job and forget about that 401k you had from 20 years ago. So just make sure during these transitions, if you do have a new day job, you are keeping track of where all of your accounts currently are. 
Well, I hadn't even thought about that, but I guess you can get so caught up in what's going on now that you might forget that. So very good point. Now, Matt, how can investors continue saving and working toward retirement with a lower income? I think that might be daunting for some to think about investing when they're not making as much. Yeah, it can be really scary if you've lost your job or if you've suffered a pay cut, but it's really important to keep the big picture in mind you are going to be working for 40 to 50 years of your life. If you've lost your job or you've otherwise suffered a setback, it's okay to ease off your retirement savings for months or even years as you get back on your feet. Due to the way that compound interest works, it actually hurts younger savers more than older savers to take time off from contributing. The only thing that I, I, oh, I really that, want that everyone makes, to- That makes sense. You know, when you think about that, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying there. Um, let's talk about the stock market a little bit. We know the stock market is where many investors turn for long-term retirement investments, but that took a major hit last March. Um, thank goodness, since then, many of the losses have stabilized or recovered a little bit, yet that drastic drop scared a lot of people. So Whitney, what is your advice to investors or workers who are panicked back in 2020 and, and have stopped contributing to retirements or savings accounts, investment accounts. Oh my goodness. That was such a scary time for so many people. And I think we saw the flip side too, even with the GameStop and how emotions play such a factor when we come to investing. So one of my biggest key pieces to help people is to really manage your emotions. Remind yourself that you don't lose money or make money in the investments and stocks until you officially sell. That's when those capital gains and losses are actually realized. And I find a really good tip to helping people manage emotions is getting more education. It's really important to continue reading books and continue understanding what does this mean for our economy? If inflation rises, our stocks are going to go down. If you know that, it's not quite as scary when it happens. So pick up where you left off, give yourself a ton of grace and get that education by reading books if that will help you. Yeah. And watching programs like this. Right? Exactly. <laughs> like that too. Uh, Matt, how do you recommend investors recoup any retirement setbacks they may have suffered? And these are people who perhaps dipped into different accounts last year just to make ends meet. The worst thing you can do is sell out of fear when markets are low and buy out of greed when markets are hot. Last year was a really good reminder of just how volatile stock markets can be. And people really have to stay the course and make asset allocation decisions that are appropriate for them in the long run. When you're young, it's okay to have investments that are risky or more volatile, but as you age, it's incredibly important to mix or rebalance into a portfolio that's more conservative. That way you can ride out storms like what we saw in 2020 without risking your nest egg. Yeah, so Whitney, there may be still some who are still a little hesitant about jumping into riskier investments. What's the best way to start saving for retirement in the middle of a pandemic? <laughs> yeah, again, give yourself a lot of grace because that is really scary. But I would say the best place to start with any financial goal, whether it's retirement or saving or whatever the heck you're working on, is to look at your budget. Dust that old budget off, look at how much free cash flow you actually have to then invest, and that'll give you a better idea of what's realistic for your life and what you can truly afford. That, that's, a, that's a good idea, looking at your budget. We have to assume that everybody's done that, so I guess we've got to make sure that some people actually do that part too. Um, <laughs> True. Yeah. Matt, what, what advice do you have for folks beginning their first jobs or starting in a new career in this really rocky economic um, environment that we are in right now? Yeah, it's, it's a really scary time. And I've had a lot of students at Wayne come to me with um, expressing their concerns. But, you know, Albert Einstein called compound interest the eighth wonder of the world. And it, and it really is the magic formula behind wealth building. No matter how little you can afford to contribute, it's important to start now, especially if you're young and you have time on your side. If your employer offers a retirement account like a 401k, please take advantage of it, especially if it has a match. You get the tax benefit and uh, the free money from your employer. Also, individual income tax rates in the U.S. are at 100-year lows, so you should consider putting money in a Roth IRA if it's available to you. And if you have children or you're a new parent, uh, I strongly recommend you explore establishing a Roth or some other retirement account for your kids. It's one of the best things you can do to set them up for future success. 
Yeah. So I have another question for you. Either one of you can answer this. As we talk about recovery, how can the stimulus payment help citizens, citizen investors, you know, during this new normal? Uh, Whitney, let's start with you. I think the stimulus payment was so helpful for a lot of investors because what it gave them is that peace of mind. It gave them a small cash cushion where then they can say, my basic needs are covered. I can cover some of these emergency expenses. And now I can start to think about investing. I think when it when you have that base layer of peace of mind, it's so much easier to be able to invest confidently and not feel like you're taking away from your financial future. Okay. Nate, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Nathan. Matt. 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 Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with that. You know, life throws us so many curveballs, and and you know, the first rule of thumb is to have uh, a couple months of uh, your of, of understand how much your life costs, yeah. and have a few months of that those expenses tucked away in an emergency fund, and, and it just gives you the peace of mind to to kind of take those challenges head on and, and know you'll be able to get through them. There's some things that you just can't put on a credit card. Yeah, there's so much information you guys are passing along that's so good. Thank you so much. Now, we want you to stick around because we're going to bring you back later. Both of you, uh, Posh and Nathan and Seth, they're all coming back at the end. They're going to, you guys are going to all answer questions for the people who are tuning in. So if you have questions, put them in that comment section uh, at the bottom of the screen that you saw earlier uh, or on your Facebook page, I should say, uh, or um, get in touch with us through the, that email address that we had earlier. So um, let's get to it. 2020 certainly taught us some tough lessons, right? One major takeaway from the pandemic is that we all, we all need a backup plan. So let's take a look at how to go about creating an appropriate cushion financially. So joining us now to talk about that are Sandra Davis. She's a financial coach and educator and Bob Ingram, a certified financial planner. Hi. Hello Hi. there. Hi to both of you. Thanks for joining us. Thank it, you so much. It's, now, it's pretty it's pretty safe to say that few people expected to use an emergency fund for a pandemic <laughs> before March 2020 hit our lives. Uh, but planning for the unknown is nothing new, of course. Um, Bob, where do you begin when establishing an emergency fund? Well, you know, really, and, and, um, actually, Whitney and Matt just actually made a couple of nice points about that to kind of lead into this. Um, but really, it starts with setting that goal for how much do you want to have as your your cushion what is that appropriate cushion and there are a number of rules of thumb uh, whether it's a, a certain percentage of annual income to always have set aside or a certain number of expenses to have set in place you know and i think it really it depends on of course single individuals and, and couples but a great um target is really three to six months of your most essential expenses you know if you're a couple both working and they both have incomes, three months might be a good start, particularly for single individuals or, or one uh, income earning household, uh, six months may be a better, a better target. Now, when you think of that amount, uh, of course, everybody's budget is a little bit different, but having an idea of what that budget is, what is the amount of, of spending that you do have each month, and then working to have three or, or six months <coughs> worth of that. And that can sound a little, uh, you know, a little daunting, to build that up, especially if you're starting from scratch. So it's important to set smaller, you know, milestones and goals along the way. Maybe it's the first thousand dollars, then maybe the first month of expenses and then build from there and set a target of how much your budget can allow each month to set aside specifically for that cushion until those milestones uh, happen. Yeah, and start thinking about that right now. Absolutely. Um, uh, Sandra, where do you begin when you're coaching your clients through planning for something that's unseen, like we don't have any idea it's coming and not even on the radar in their wildest imagination? How do you begin that process with them? Yeah, so first we breathe, right? First, we take a really good, solid, deep breath and get a grip on what's going on now. It's really important that we remember that experiencing financial distress is not a character flaw. So being kind and being gentle and setting really specific goals that are based on what's most important to you. And, and I think that 
uh, when we begin to think about it that way, we can start to focus on what have these experiences taught us about ourselves? What do I know about myself now that I didn't know at the beginning of the pandemic? I know that I am, I can and I'm willing to make adjustments. I don't like to cook. I'm not a great cook, but I started budgeting for those boxes and I started doing things differently to be able to manage. I think one of the things that happens for folks is that when we start to think about an emergency fund, uh, we think about it differently than maybe is, is helpful. There's a difference between a periodic expense and an emergency fund. And often we have what we call emergency funds that we actually use for things that we know are coming. So I think what, in addition to the rule of thumb that, that was just dropped, thank you for giving people the reasons why we say three to six months, you know, three months if you are a two income household, six months if you're a one income household. There's financial planning wisdom beyond that. It's not a random number, but, but even deeper than that is what makes you feel safe? how much money needs to be available to you that you feel like you can manage if things go very, very wrong. And that could be, you know, somebody leaves, somebody dies, we get a global pandemic. What has to be there and available to you to be able to um, be okay uh, in the midst of some very traumatic things? And the thing that I invite people to start with is getting a full checkpoint of where they are right now. I don't feel that it's necessary to reiterate what the other folks on this call have said, because that information is a personal choice. And if we first can look at what is available to us, not only with our immediate funding sources, but also resources in our communities, is a really good way to start taking a look at where you are and what you need. Yeah, and that's good advice. A lot of people don't take the time to kind of assess. They're just kind of moving through life and not looking at where they are right now. Um, Bob, what, what options do investors have to, to actually build wealth though? Yeah, it, and that's a really good question. Uh, in today's world, there are so many different choices available to us from cash uh, accounts and, and bank accounts and credit union accounts all the way through more complicated retirement plans through employers and and other financial products uh, in the industry it's great in one sense that there are choices but that can be very overwhelming when you think about starting with a cash cushion though um, what that means is you might need money at any point in time you it might need to be next week when an emergency happens it could be the next year but it, it may not be out there years and years in the future, like something like retirement planning. So to start investing for a cushion, you have to have money that can be readily available and the value that you're trying to have in the cushion is predictable. So what does that mean? It can't be in, in some kind of an investment that can fluctuate in value quite a bit, whereas longer term investments you know, you may have the opportunity and the time to ride out market cycles and, and the ups and downs of, of investing. So keeping things in, in cash type uh, investments, interest bearing accounts, something as simple as a savings account, maybe a money market account. And in years past, uh, we probably earned a little bit more than we might be used to earning uh, in, in today's environment with the interest rates. I know sometimes it can be frustrating that we just don't feel like we're earning anything in, in gaining anything in those uh, shorter term, you know, cash-based and interest-bearing uh, accounts. But the most important thing to remember is these are the funds that are there for emergencies at any time. And once you start building those funds and have that in place, well, then you have the confidence to start looking at more longer-term investments, you know, adding to your retirement plans through work, whether the 401k, you take advantage of matching uh, contributions, the IRA investments, individual retirement arrangements, those can be built as you um, develop your, your cushion first. Doesn't mean you need to have your entire cushion built, but you need to get that started in something that's more secure and safe. Yeah, I like the idea of starting small and not taking on a thinking you're going into a big chunk. You're going to do a whole lot in the beginning. So, Sandra, is there a baseline of wealth and savings that you recommend that every investor strive to achieve? Well, I'm sure, as my colleague here will tell you, the only standard financial planning answer is it 
depends. There is no one right answer for everyone. My favorite thing to encourage people do, to do is create Focus on the habit first and the amount second. Often when people are in some level of financial distress or they feel like they're starting over again, one thing I invite people to do is just start with that 52-week savings plan. And week one, you can start anytime during the year. Many people started at the beginning of the year. Week one, you save a dollar. Week two, you save $2. Week 15, you save $15. At the end of 52 weeks, you have $13.78. And the, the point of that is to build the momentum. Most of the folks that I coach, if they've gone through something as traumatic as what we're experiencing now, or a death in the family, or the loss of a job, just the confidence that comes with being able to set a target, irrespective of how small it is, and meet that target is so crucial. So, you know, we, we've already given the conversation around how much of an emergency fund. I just think it's really important to recognize the difference between saving and investing and ensuring that when you're saving, you're protecting money that you need to be there both now and maybe into the future. And when we're investing, we're investing because we want that money to grow and we're in a position to take more risk with it. And so I think the most important thing that I would say it, to someone who's rebuilding or, or going through that stage, start with the thing that works right? It might be you're going to save with the 52-week savings plan. It might be you're going to start with $5 a pay period with your uh, employer or making sure that you meet the match with your employer. Start where you are and give yourself, number one, the grace and then the commitment to yourself to look out for your future self. I'm, you know, I, I happen to be one of those folks who's 60 um, and it is very different at this stage than it was for me even 20 years ago. But the thing that I know is true is that as long as I'm looking out for future Sandra, as well as I'm looking out for today, Sandra, I'm at least on the right track. Find out what things are available to you, take advantage of what's available to you, whether it's paycheck protection, whether it's unemployment, whatever is available to you. Experiencing emergencies in your financial lives is not a character flaw. Yeah, they, I'm, I love that you keep saying give yourself grace because I think people need to hear that and breathe. That that part too, I liked. Um, Bob, aside from a pandemic, nobody sees that ever coming, <laughs> but what other more common emergencies or surprise expenses might require someone to understand why they should create the cushion? Yeah, and really, you know, emergencies or, or just really any needs for to draw on cash savings, it, it can come from so many different directions. So th some starting with the just day-to-day -day things that happen in our lives, you know, the kind of the example of you have the house or, or a car and, you know, car breaks down, you have uh, emergency repairs that happen or, you know, the old you know, furnace goes out at the house or you need to have other, some sort of work or other maintenance that can happen day to day. You don't need a pandemic or an emergency event happening out, out in the world. It, it's just part of our daily lives. Then there are the other um, situations that could be specific to, to families. Folks may have different medical conditions that will that will happen and maybe uh, cut, uh, catch them by surprise. Besides just a pandemic, remember there's a whole lot of, of, of health challenges out there facing families today. And out of nowhere, something can happen and, and a medical expense can severely set people back financially. So a reserve or emergency funds can keep people moving forward if they can draw on that and they don't have to take on debt. You may have, um, especially with today with, with the baby boomer generation and those retiring, um, there's a reason why they're also referred to as the sandwich generation, where you have, you have individuals that may be caring for, for aging parents or, or other family members and providing some support. At the same time, they may have uh, adult children that, uh, that they're helping and supporting in some, in some way. So they're, you know, a lot of folks are getting, um, having to support things and having uh, those other uh, resource draws from, from different angles. So even those concerns, uh, besides just longer term uh, care needs that people might have. So lots of different reasons why having some ready cash or at least reserves to draw on uh, allows and, and again, keeps their rest of their financial plan intact. If you don't have to draw on future retirement resources, 
well, then your own retirement can still be intact, even though you may be dealing with some of these other emergencies or, or frankly, other opportunities that you can use for cash. Okay, it's good things to think about. And, and then while we're talking, people are thinking about questions for you guys. So I want you both to stay there. And I want to invite back all of our panelists and uh, we can take those viewer questions. And if you do have a question, haven't had a chance to put it in, drop it in the chat section of the PBS Books Facebook Live post or, or send an email to the address on your screen and we will get through as many as we can in the next few minutes and before we wrap up. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the first one that we have. Uh, when it comes to retirement planning right now, is it better to, to save or to invest? And I guess right now, I'll see if, if Matt, if you have some answer for that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think I save the, the questions asking if it's, if it's um, um, intended to build an emergency fund. I mean, I think the emergency fund always, always, always has to come first because you never know what, what, uh, what is around the corner. Uh, I think getting the emergency fund out of the way is, is foundational, and then you can really start focusing on the long term and, and accumulating wealth. Yeah. Now, Seth, I had a question for you. I was just thinking of today's kids as they look at the world because they've grown up in a pandemic. Do you think they'll think differently about money and spending and those kinds of things, especially if they're in their teen years, maybe in their early 20s? Are you still with us, Seth? Donna, I'd like to take that one. I think okay, so, go, I, go, I, for I think, go for so, it. So, so let's keep in mind, think about what we heard, those of us who are of my generation, what we heard from our family members who lived through the Great Depression. You know, you hear stories about saving aluminum foil and not throwing away everything. I remember my mother would put a garbage bag inside of a garbage bag because she didn't want to use the main garbage bag that she had to pay for. And, and so when we have these types of situations, our young people are going to be impacted. And this is where uh, coaching is such a, a big deal because what we get to is the behavior under the, the, the reason under the behavior. So when we look at the choices that we make, so for instance, I was born and raised in San Francisco. I lived through the 1989 earthquake, which meant I couldn't go to the bank and get my cash out. So despite having ready cash in a bank account, I couldn't get it. So now I have a safe place that I keep cash that I can access in addition to what is in my periodic expenses, what is in my emergency fund, and then what's my investments. So I actually have four levels of savings that I maintain, and it is a direct result of being in 1989 and bridges falling down all around us and not being able to get cash out to be able to take care of my family. So we can expect a similar situation for, for, for most of us, not just young people, but particularly recognizing that young people may not have the language to process it well. Yeah. What's interesting is that I think, you know, the people who um, went through Katrina or some of the big um, hurricanes are, have felt that same way where they just didn't have access to anything. And so they probably look at life in a different way. And maybe this pandemic will have us all doing that a, a little bit differently. Um, I know we talked a little bit earlier about the, um, the stimulus money. I wanted to get into that uh, too, but we have another question. What does COVID mean for the global market investments a, a little bit? And maybe you could talk about that a little bit, um, Nathan, in terms of, I know Invest Atlanta, but in terms of like a, go, a global look at everything. Well, this is such a great question. You know, as we look at the economy uh, for the city and for the nation and the global economy, you know, last year was a scary time. Um, everything kind of ground to, to a halt. Um, as we look into the short term and the, and the midterm, um, for Atlanta, it's looking fantastic. Uh, recent Oxford economics data shows that we're going to fare very well uh, compared to other uh, cities in the nation. We have a real diversified economy um, in Atlanta, and so part of that is global investment. Uh, so um, those of you who are not in Atlanta, we had some major announcements. Microsoft has committed their East Coast tech hub to the city of Atlanta, bringing 15,000 jobs. We've received several large um, announcements over the past week. So 
We see a sharp uptick um, in business and, and announcements for future investments in the city. And those include global investments. Um, foreign direct investment in the city is a, is a key part of our economy, um, not only in the city, but as a nation. Um, and so um, I, I take a positive outlook on where the economy is is headed in the in the short term and near term, um, and so I'm looking very very much forward to see seeing how that plays out. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to to uh, to see how a lot of companies are trying to pivot out of this particular situation. I know that um, um, Posh, I was interested in asking you if you look at your business and your approach to things in a different way and. And you talk to other people when you talk to other people who are small business owners, if they're doing things differently. Absolutely. Um, I'm definitely in a position now where I'm putting funds inside the business in a different manner than I did before. So definitely. OK, uh, Bob, Bob Ingram, uh, I wanted to ask is has uh, anything if you were looking at global investment a little differently than you did before too. Well, I think, uh, you know, we, we still have um, as a, as a team and in, in our firm, um, you know, we certainly like to get to see what's, what's out there without trying to predict or, or, you know, make any sort of a market call. Certainly we know that that's, that's a difficult game and not one we want to try to, to try to play, but we do see the positive uh, aspects of not only, you know, the recovery and, you know, pent up demand, uh, in the marketplace and, and in effect, uh, impacting different industries. We also, of course, have this, uh, the most recent stimulus uh, package, which is going to add more money into pockets and, and, and businesses as well. So those are all positive signs. Um, at the same time, we are certainly cautious in looking and cautiously optimistic in a sense of where the markets, you know, particularly the U.S. stock market and specifically the U.S. Uh, stock market in large companies that really drove markets higher, even through the pandemic last year, up to the beginning of this year. And with you know, the, relatively what their valuations are, uh, are, are high by historical standards, doesn't mean they can't go higher, but uh, that always has a gives us a little bit of caution um, where you, know, you just have to make sure your portfolios are diversified and at any given time, there could be a, a market correction. We wouldn't be surprised if that would if were to happen. There's so much good news already priced into a lot of the markets that, um, that we just want to take a, be a little bit cautious with investments and make sure clients are have good cash positioning for needs over the next 12 to 18 months and uh, can weather uh, markets movements just like we saw last year. Yeah, I think a lot of people are just waiting to see what happens. Um, let, a question for you, Whitney. Uh, besides stocks and bonds, what other investments should uh, people consider right now? This is a question for some from someone who says, "What other what other investments should I consider right now because of the unusual economic market?" Wow, I think this is such a great opportunity to really invest in yourself and your own education. There are so many different jobs out there that didn't exist even five or 10 years ago. And I think I see that being the future as well. So one of the best things that you can do is start to learn a new skill. Maybe it's podcast editing. Maybe it's video editing. Maybe it's completely different things that you had never even done before. But I think if you're willing to put a little bit of money into your own education and get a new skill, that's going to help you so much from an income standpoint, which then gives you more money to then turn around and invest towards your retirement. So what a great opportunity with all of the on-demand learning platforms, courses, coaching. There's so many different ways to learn new skills. And I think that's the best place to invest right now. Um, we, no, we don't have the, a question like this, but I, I wanted to ask you, uh, Matt, if you can talk a little bit about cryptocurrency a little bit for us briefly. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly on everyone's mind these days. Um, you know, it, it, I think the two things to remember about it are it's uh, very volatile and it's not as well regulated as most other investments. Um, if, if you decide that it's something that uh, you'd like to have as part of your investment strategy, I, I strongly encourage you to consider it as you would any other alternative investment. And, and that's actually what we're starting to see. Uh, what we've seen the last 12 months or so is cryptocurrency for, for some investors has started to kind of take the place of 
gold or other precious metals and commodities as a as a hedge. And so if it's something that you're interested in, you know, if you, if you take a step back and look at your own net worth or the value of your portfolio and you put, um, you know, say a, a single digit percentage of, of your worth into it, you know, four or five, six percent, something like that. It's enough where you don't feel bad if, if Bitcoin triples in value uh, uh, that you missed out. But it's also not so much that if it falls by 50 percent, you're, you're left uh, you're, you're left in a lurch. Um, so, you know, understand its volatility, understand it's not regulated. If you decide it's for you, uh, be smart about the investment. Yeah, it's, it's, for, for me, I'll be, admit, it sounds a little scary. So I, I really have to look into this whole thing a little bit more. Um, we do have another question. Uh, and uh, Sandra, I'll ask you uh, first to, to um, answer this. Are there any investments or sectors I should avoid in an uncertain market? like the, the one that we are experiencing right now? Yeah, so I am a believer in comprehensive financial planning. So I think that any investment that you have should be in the context of a comprehensive plan that is designed to meet your needs based on what you have available to you and where you are now, including not only your risk tolerance, but your risk capacity. So I would say any investment that you should avoid should be any investment that keeps you up at night. And that's why having a, a good relationship with a financial planner, whether it is a paid service that you get through uh, a resource referral that you need or through pro bono planning uh, that those are ways that you can get what you need. I truly believe that everyone should have a comprehensive financial plan. And then I think Bob would be great to respond to the rest of that. Go for it, Bob. Yeah. Well, I would, I would second the point about comprehensive planning and the importance of the investment strategy is, is the, the way that you're executing to make the plan go. And from you know, places to avoid in, in terms of investments, it, it really comes down most importantly to what, when is, what is the time frame, and of course risk tolerance, but what is the time frame in particular for the, for the money needs that you're investing or, or trying to save for? Um, back to that cash cushion or, or short-term money need, if you might need the resources, um, anytime in the next couple of years, for example, you want to avoid investment uh, asset classes or types of assets that move in value and that move wildly or can move wildly in value. So something that can be uh, held for long periods of time where you can ride out you know, the ups and downs or that volatility, that's fine for the longer term for money that you may not need for the next three, five, 10 plus years but anything you may need in the next year or two or even three should be in a you know more stable um, types of investments that don't move as as wildly or um, as volatile. Okay, we have another question, and this is for uh, Nathan and Posh. We'll start with you, Nathan. What would you say to someone wanting to start a new business right now? Well, look, I think that's a great question. And I think uh, there are a lot of opportunities um, right now and in the near term. I think there's gonna be additional federal resources that are gonna be made available uh, for those who wanna start new businesses. You know, unfortunately we, we have seen a lot of our businesses um, not be able to survive. Uh, that really creates, um, creates a space where potential entrepreneurs or startups or businesses want to want to grow. Um, have an opportunity for growth. So I think now is a really great time, right before things really start to open up, um, that this will actually create opportunity for those um, who, are, who are looking for it. And I think you will see um, a real uh, surge in those uh, types of startup businesses who are taking advantage of, of, of the opportunities in the market. Okay, Posh? So the main thing I'd say is create a solid business plan. And then from that business plan, set your long-term goals. And from the long-term goals, set short-term term goals so that you can stay on track. And um, if you can find a business coach and any people, entrepreneurs that you know that are successful, seek advice, don't be afraid to ask questions and follow the goals. Planning is the best thing. Yeah, it sounds like you you've learned a lot, and that that you uh, you can you have good information to pass on to other people. But Sandra, I, I, we want to know those four levels of savings again that you you talked about earlier. 
and we need a reminder. Yeah, Donna, that saved my life. So the first is that I have one month's worth of my household expenses in my house. I keep it in the safe place. And this is crucial. That whole idea of saving under the mattress, don't do that. That's the first place people look if they break into your house. So find some place that is safe, that you can have it broken out into um, uh, into bills that you can use. And then there is the save slash spend account. That's your periodic. You know you're going to use that. So go to a credit union, go to a bank, someplace where you can have an account that you know you're going to use. Then the emergency savings that you don't want to use. You know, the goal is to not have to use that. And then finally, your investments account, What or your investment accounts, what's going to be for the long run. Okay. Well, we, we got a lot of information today. I want to thank all of you for passing along information. I know people took that, took notes and are um, looking at their lives in a little different way, thanks to the advice that you passed along to them. So thanks to all of our wonderful panelists and those of you who submitted questions, thank you to you too. Um, we want to, if you want to find out more about uh, financial and investment recovery in this post COVID world, uh, visit investorprotection.org or you can go to the NASAA website for additional resources in your state. And for a copy of this episode, we'll be uploading it to pbsbooks.org slash WI65, when I'm 65. And remember to utilize your resources for books, seminars, and more tools about retirement planning. Now, Fred, this has been just a great conversation today about um, about everything involving finances, and it really gives me hope, I think. Wow, D uh, Donna Lowry, some great live reporting. I know you've put a lot of uh, work and uh, research into this. Any surprises, any big takeaways following uh, moderating these panels? The, the, the feeling is that we should um, not hold back, that it, it even though it feels pretty scary right now, and this past year has been scary for a lot of people, that we should still feel comfortable with jumping out there and making investments in savings and making sure we have a little cushion, those kinds of things. And one of my favorite quotes was the one uh, that wealth, um, that uh, wealth building is the eighth wonder of the world. I hadn't heard that one before, but I like it. <laughs> well, the, the magic of compound, uh, compound interest. And of course, uh, we know financial investor education, uh, as you pointed out, is like learning the alphabet. You, you learn the basics, but also important to recognize when you need to get some professional help. Yeah, I think that is important. And and I think a lot of people are afraid to do that because they think that, first of all, that takes money away from them. But that's an investment, too, in just making sure you get some help to do the right thing, to do it the right way. Uh, Donna Lowry, a great thanks to you. I know it's been a month's worth of work working on this episode. Uh, looking for the next one. Thank you so much uh, for leading the conversation today. I enjoyed it. All right, and we want to thank all of you for joining us. Check out those resources that Donna was pointing out for more information. Uh, and then join us again next month as we discuss investing, what's new and what's not, how GameStop traders could force brokerage companies to rethink certain strategies uh, and the traditional investor moves that are still in style. Once again, thanks for sharing some of your time with us uh, for PBS Books, the Investment Protection Trust, and the whole When I'm 65 crew, I'm Fred Nahat. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.